1999 is not generally known as a powerful year in the HIV epidemic. But in many ways, it is particularly powerful for those of us in Ontario and uh, also powerful for many people that have access to antiretrovirals and protease inhibitors. 1999 was the time when we started to think that the elastic could be extended instead of shrunk in terms of living with HIV. Protease had been with us for a couple of years and people like myself were ready for the end of the conveyor belt but suddenly somebody threw the switch and we needed to readjust. The readjustment meant that there was a different kind of understanding that had to be brought about to HIV. The kinds of things that we would be concerned about shifted. The kinds of things that became important were shifted. That two years since the evolution of protease inhibitors made a tremendous mind shift. And that was one of the influences that entered into the creation of the Ontario HIV Treatment Network. Another was that the Ontario government shifted some of its resources in terms of clinics in Toronto. And that resulted in some activism and some advocacy for a rethink. This all resulted in a new policy of the Ontario government to infuse the Ontario response. What got created was this being called the HIV Treatment Network, and its name implies was a treatment focus. But it really is a research funding organization. And as a research funding organization, the other key word is network. This was not a traditional HIV research funding organization of funding the best and the brightest through an investigator-driven application process. We had a responsibility to network. We had a responsibility to build relationships, and we have a responsibility to take the notion of a network as a growing organic being. That is very different. It's a different set of responsibilities. The Ontario HIV Treatment Network had two principal parts to its mission statement. The first is to support and conduct research. Now that is interesting in that we support, we fund research, but also we undertake research. The second thing, which is the more dynamic and organic part of the Ontario HIV Treatment Network, is sharing knowledge for action. Putting knowledge in the hands of people living with HIV. We know that a lot of research gets developed and then reached as a buffer and doesn't go any further. But we have a responsibility to make that relationship bridge between research and putting it in the hands of people that can act. And that includes people living with HIV, community-based AIDS organizations, health service providers, policy makers. We have a responsibility as part of our mission to build those partnerships. And it's underpinned by a governance structure, a relationship structure, and a network structure involving four key principal people and roles. First and foremost are people living with and at risk to HIV. And within that, we have our key populations. There have been a number of talks in this conference about key populations. We have our own. And this is really, really key in that the people living with and at risk to HIV and our key populations have got many, many different levels. Ontario is the part of the country that has, it looks rather like a squashed Italy, but at the country level, at the province level, 40% of Canadians live here. It's got the highest incidence of HIV, the highest prevalence of HIV, and also the highest distribution of different ethnicities. Canada is a country of immigrants and aboriginals, our original owners of the lands. And each of those populations are vulnerable <coughs> to HIV. So people living with and at risk to HIV is not a homogenous group. And we have currently the under development five different strategies for key populations defining the research. So people living with and at risk to HIV drive our organization. Researchers drive our organization. 
that is researchers in hospitals, clinics, and universities. They are at the table. Service providers, healthcare professionals, social workers, psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses are at the table. Policymakers are at the table. The government sits at our governance table. But the really exciting thing about public policy, as you know, is that it's a ball in motion. Occasionally it stops and we all think we have a policy, but it always gets reorganized. That's the nature of policy. And so though policymakers in a formal sense are at the table in government and other organizations, it's really key to understand that everybody at the table is a policy driver and a policy maker. That the policy field is a flat one. Yes, it may end up on some official's desk and it ends up with a budget and a plan, but it is our core essence that we do things dynamically and we do things around the table with everybody involved. So though this presentation is, you know, as Catherine described, labeled this, I want to give you a visual metaphor to understand what I think dynamic partnerships are about. Now, most of you in this room have probably run a three-legged race at some point, and if you have, just think of it for a minute, and you'll find your body's beginning to adjust back to that point. The beauty of a three-legged race is in what has to be negotiated on a constant basis while in movement. And though these two kids here are looking on the race already, they will have had some negotiations, they will have reached some agreement, they will have had some practice runs, they will have fallen over, and they would have reached a state of synchrony that allowed them to propel themselves forward, and they would keep that synchrony going through negotiation at a cellular level throughout the race. Look into the eyes of these two young guys, and you will see that they are placed about a meter and a half ahead while taking in the periphery. And having that focus on that stretch of land ahead is one of the really effective parts of partnership, is that both believe that it's an automatic thing that you'll look directly ahead, but not completely ahead, otherwise you'll fall. At the same time, knowing that you have in your mind an arrival point. And in any race, though crossing the finish line is key, the thing that is wanted to be attained is the arrival at the experience of completion. And all good partnerships have that in their minds and in their hearts and in their souls as a place of arrival in relationship. But keeping an eye on the immediate. And in this sense, I think that as a metaphor for partnership development, the three-legged race was the closest I could become to something that was really, really alive. And in that sense, I think that the three-legged race is a, a, a notion of constant recalibration of partnership. And some of us in the Ontario HIV Treatment Network are doing something like a 15-legged race. And yes, we fall over, and yes, we get up. But certainly, the commitment to have the vision to the end result is the dream of an altered state that we gets us from A to B. I want to give you a couple of examples of partnership. Communities were telling us that housing was an issue. And this is where the anathema of the name of the Ontario HIV treatment network that was dreamed 15 years ago has deepened significantly. This is not necessarily about treatment, it's about going upstream. It's about those issues that lay below the continuation of this epidemic. Housing was a concern. We undertook a study, a cohort of 600 people living with HIV that did not have homes. 50%, sorry, 600 people with living with HIV, 50% of whom did not have homes. And the evidence was astounding that the engagement in care was poor, that people's self-perception was poor, and that the relationship to self-esteem was bad, as you can well imagine. A two-year follow-up study demonstrated that those in supportive housing 
have better health care, are less reliable on food banks, are not going to the emergency hospital so quickly, and most particularly have a vibrant connection with their engagement in care. And as we expand into treatment cascades, this is a key thing to understand of what in fact is necessary as the baseboards for engagement in care. The second one is about anal cancer. Clinicians were saying to us, we need research into anal cancer. HIV positive men that have got a history of engagement in anal sex are at greater risk to HIV cancer at late stages. We put in place the research. We found that this was so. We funded research into it. We funded people to train in it. We bought the equipment. And now HIV positive men have access to early detection of anal cancer and subsequently um, a much better result. And finally, that this is now influencing public policy on the availability of HPV vaccines. As I leave you, I want to leave you with our emerging vision, which is communities thriving now, which means that action now has a long-term result and also thriving beyond HIV, which is HIV not necessarily always at the center, but the person at the center <coughs> of which HIV may be part. And I leave you with the little notion that the steps of getting are the qualities of being there. Thank you very much.